anything, if you want to say something about yourself, uh, if you want to offer something, if you have something to offer, skills or money, I don't know, um, please do that too. Um, and then we're going to have our keynote, which is about 30 minutes, followed by Q&A. And we're wrapping up, hanging out a little bit, and then we're heading over to the United Ale House, which is our newest sponsor for the, so for the pet meetup. So they're going to give us happy hour pricing tonight again, um, for, for the second time. Uh, so really excited about that. The other sponsor is obviously the Rocket Launch, which enables us to be here. So thanks for that. You're buying me beers. I bought them last week. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, uh, just to get a feeling, who was here for the first time? Alright, about 50%. That's pretty good. Very excited. Uh, thanks for coming out. Make sure you tell your friends if you like it. Um, also tell them if you don't like it, because they might. Who knows? Uh, we're, getting a, we're getting a pretty good mix of, you know, between entrepreneurial topics and uh, tech topics. Today we are like, I would, I would define that as tech topic, but it has a design twist to it, or a design point of view, I should say. Uh, so that should be interesting. And uh, next month's meetup, actually, uh, let's see, let's see who would consider themselves a tech, first of all. Okay. All right, all right. Maybe a bit longer. <laughs> Creatives, uh, you know, artists, service providers, sorts of those sorts. Investors. All right. I, I, I at least expect to see one hand. <laughs> um, and entrepreneurs. All right. Good. Most of us. Excellent. So we grew steady. Um, we slowed down a little bit. I'm not quite sure why that is that month. Um, most people are in a holiday spirit, maybe already floating around, drinking a lot of eggnog. Um, not so much in, in the startup mood. But thanks again. Um, it's for all of you, uh, which is why we started this. It's supposed to be a community of people, and the more we have, the better it is. Which is also why I encourage you to just speak up in the 30 seconds, say what you what you do, what you're in need of, and what you can offer. So next month's meetup. Peter Phelps over here agreed to, to give, give the keynote next month. Um, another completely different topic, but extremely important and exciting, nonetheless, um, about where you get your money for your project, startup, company, whatever it might be. So definitely come out to that one. You probably don't want to miss that. I can guarantee you, at some point, you will need money. <laughs> so with that being said, who wants to give a, give a shout out? Anyone? No? Yeah, come on. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So my name is Marius. Marius Young, for those who don't know me already. And this is my second time being here. We added ourselves, I think, in LinkedIn for, for some reason already. But my, my purpose for, for being here is to get to know other people in the industry. We, I do digital marketing a lot. I have a, almost 20 years of background of software development. Uh, that's all about it. <laughs> so good. I want to meet people. I'll do my blur for you know preview. Sure. So, so, so my name is Peter Phelps. So much my picture was up there before. So um, Wayne introduced me in here. I was here with him the other day, looking around, and uh, I agreed to do that thing next uh, next month. So basically, my background is I'm a CPA and I have an MBA, and I've, I've been in a lot of technology companies for the last 30 years, uh, <coughs> primarily as CFO of technology companies. So then. Um, a lot of them end up in, in, in uh, transactions. We sold them, or they whatever. They we sold them. They went under. They <laughs> they went away. Whatever you know, whatever, whatever it was, something happened. So then, so recently, I've just been helping a lot of technology companies, like helping them as kind of a contract CFO, or helping them raise capital, or helping them on the board, whatever makes sense. And just trying to uh, trying to use my experience to help um, companies get going. Since since my wife driving down to Florida, people are doing down here. We're, before I was living in Boston for many, many years. So that our meetup in Boston was uh, 3,200 people, but you know, so it's it's you know shows us plenty of room for growth. So I'm just trying to kind of do that, try to help any way I can. So thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next. I'll month. step in. See you next month. Right. So I'm Andrew Delush, but I'm with M Drive, and I'm looking for a CFO. Perfect. What's your company called? M Drive. 
Sure. M Drive. So we are a uh, fleet analytics uh, predictive analysis. It's big data. It's um, we're able to we're pulling in literally uh, hundreds of sets of data, and we're actually able with eighty five percent accuracy predict that a driver is going to be in an accident. That's for geared towards the fleet market, not the consumer market like right? progressive. And we have an eighty five percent. I actually don't get the hypocrisy about you that you never moved down here. You don't have to. No, we're a hundred percent virtual company. Okay, we'll talk later. Yeah. We'll talk so. Later. Right. So Thanks. that's exactly what I'm talking about. Right? This is what that's, it's all about. Man. That's what, really why we're is. here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not putting on this show for myself, although I, I do thoroughly enjoy it. Um, but it's it's for all of you. So uh, it has happened before. Connections are being made in meetups like that. I've seen it uh, before. I was in New Jersey before for a couple of years in meetups, and same there. You know, thousands of members, and sometimes you just give it a shout out, and you know, three days later you have a patent written for free by some other member. You know, you don't get that everywhere, right? So, um, short introduction again. Lee, uh, the very Lee over here, uh, has agreed to, to give us a little bit of his wisdom of game development and the art behind it. I am. Um, I, I thought I thought it was very cool. Actually, we met at, at a art fair, I guess, um, to describe it that way. And he, he was selling his art there, and he's. Um, a fan of pixel art. Is it called pixel art? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which, which I think is very cool uh, for for those of you who, who try to get uh, these days. You can, or recently, you can get the NES Classic Edition again. Um, I couldn't get my hands on one yet, but you know that sort of takes you a little bit back there as well. Um, hoping to get one as well soon. So I would say, without further ado, I'll hand the stage to you. And. That's me dressed up as Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park, by the way. Not just me. <laughs> <laughs> that was my Halloween costume. Yeah. Two for one. Good. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thanks everybody thanks for coming out. Um, I want to thank Sven for having this or putting it together, and the Rocket Lounge for for hosting it. Let's see if I can get on this. Lee Brettschneider. I'm a multimedia artist. Um, this is from Nothing to Nindy, an artist had first dived into indie game development. If you're wondering what Nindy is, that is short for Nintendo Indie Game. So there's a cute little term that was kind of buzzing around online last year. Uh, I was lead game artist on one. It's called Temple Yog. It's actually my first time working on a video game, and I thought I'd come share the experience with you guys and give you a look inside the world of indie game development and marketing. Um, it's not gonna be too much of a tech, technical driven, uh, it's gonna be more about workflow and like I said, marketing, but I'd be happy to answer any technical questions you have for Q&A. So uh, I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of what the game is and I'm gonna try and play this trailer here if I can. You know what direction the... Uh, yeah, I don't. There's not too many videos in here. Oh, there it is. Okay, and then sound will be turned down probably. All right, so uh, Temple of Yog is a game about human sacrifice. It's a Nintendo Wii U exclusive, uh, which you'll see why in a little bit. Um, basically, it takes advantage of the unique hardware of the Wii U. Who in here has seen a Wii U before? You know how the controller has a screen on it? Yep. Well, um, Temple of Yog, it's like two different like mazes stacked on top of each other. That's kind of like the, the core gameplay mechanic. So you play on your TV, and then in order to get past the different mazes that are procedurally generated in the game, you have to teleport your character down onto the gamepad, back and forth. Uh, it's a retro roguelike twin stick shooter. That's like the full subgenre title. I'll break that down for you a little bit. Retro, obviously, you can see the 8 bit art style, pixel art. So. The music and the, the look is evocative of like games from the past. Roguelike is a genre of gaming. Has anybody played a roguelike? Cool. So roguelikes are known for their extreme difficulty. And that was kind of like the core impetus for the game itself was that 
we both agreed that games are like too easy these days. I once beat a Call of Duty game while I was on the phone. <laughs> I was like, oh, weird, I just beat Call of Duty 4. I gotta go. <laughs> Um, so we wanted to make a, a very difficult game, and roguelikes are very difficult. They're so difficult, in fact, that they feature a characteristic called permadeath, where if your character dies, you basically lose everything and have to start over. We found a fun way around that, though. I'll get to it in a little bit. And then Twin Six Shooter is the last part. So you use the left stick to move your character and the right stick to, to fire a bolt. So it's a retro roguelike Twin Six Shooter. Now, uh, like I said, I had very little prior experience in this industry beforehand, so you're probably wondering how I got to work on a video game for Nintendo. Um, I did have a couple of years of animation, animation expertise ahead of time. I actually taught animation for a little bit at Florida State University. And I also had a couple of decades of experience of playing video games. So I just had <laughs> natural interest there. And right about the time that I got invited to uh, work on this game, um, I was actually developing my, I just had a hobbyist interest in game design, so I started developing a card game to try and get into it. And then once this opportunity came up, I was like, well, I should just switch over to this video game. Probably a higher chance of success going on that. And I could always work on the card game later on my own. So how that came together was I went to the wedding of the, the game developer, and uh, he had already like known about my work. We had, we had worked together on a couple different smaller projects in the past. So he knew that I was uh, responsible in that aspect. And he just asked if I had any interest in working on this game. He had told me about the game before, and I thought it sounded like a good idea. It was unique with the two-screen thing. So I said yes, um, because it did seem to have kind of this unique selling point. I know the last talk, there was talk about like waiting and being eighth in line to do something so that you could really nail it. But I would argue that there's also something cool about being the first to do it, you know? But, um, yeah, so this is basically how it works down in the whole slower, passing the <coughs> the trailer. You can see here that when you come up to a wall, you press the uh, button on the back of the controller, you would switch screens, and then these are two different viewing modes that we had in the game. So if you wanted to, you could always have your character be on the screen in the background and swap out, or you could actually have the character go back and forth. And this was something that I had not seen on the Wii U at all. Usually, um, games that are ported to the Wii U they're not made with two screens in mind, so they have to figure out what information to put on that screen. So it's usually reference information, like an inventory or a map. I hadn't seen it being used for like core gameplay before, so it was very interesting to me, so I, I agreed to join the development of that. This is the team right here. So this is Cody, the creator of the, the game. This is uh, me, Goofin, right in front. This is Louis. Um, he did some voiceovers in the game, and Peter behind him is, uh, he did the soundtrack. He did kind of the David soundtrack. Very talented guitar virtuoso as well. Uh, plays by the name Dr. Zylog, if you're, if you're interested, if you watch the trailer and you like the music. Now, their uh, inputs were pretty much done within a matter of weeks. Like, they kind of submitted the work. So it was really just a core development of me and Cody working through most of the development process. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they were, they were awesome to have on the project. Now, at the point that I came on, Cody had already developed a, a prototype which I have a little video of that too. This is actually the first thing I did when I came on the, the team was just kind of put together this trailer that we could show to Nintendo to kind of get the right. Thank you. Kind of get the whole idea down. <coughs> and we'll just watch a little bit of this. Um, it's basically the same format as the last trailer, but it was nice that the prototype was already built because I could actually play through the idea that he described to me. And it had like the two screen thing. It was all done on a PC, so you didn't really have it on the Wii U. But um, you know, the, the core idea was there. There was four different classes. They each had the specials that they would end up with. And this corresponded with a game design document that he had written too, which was very valuable because it really outlined the entire scope of the game and let me know as the artist what I would have to concentrate on in the full scope of, of what would be necessary to work on this. Now, to save time, I initially started operating like based on these sprites. These are licensed sprites. He just like bought a license to, you know, for 200 bucks or something. And then he got a whole pack of monsters and stuff. I was thinking I recognized that from the, uh, the Unity marketplace. That was just yes, that exactly. Yeah, so he bought that and then, uh, and then made a prototype out of it. And I was trying to, since he already had the license, I was basically just trying to modify those sprites and then add my own. But I felt kind of like limited with them. Um, 
my ego got in the way, and I was like, I want to just wash this thing with my art. Really, that's what happened. But yeah, the, the, the sprites, they only had two directions. They would mirror things. So if you had like a character with a sword, and they would go the other direction, their sword would, because it was a mirror image, it would just flip hands. That really bugged me. Anyway, I talked to Cody about increasing my level of work like eight times, and for some reason he agreed. So we were off and running at that, at that point. But yeah, going back to it, uh, game design document, any kind of, any big project you want, I think having a guiding document is a good, good idea. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk about working on the game a little bit and our, our workflow and our process. Uh, there were actually like thousands of pieces of art that needed to be made for this, and we had a short amount of time to do it, so that was kind of like one of my background goals is like figure out how to make all of these like ideals that we have, like, oh, we want to have eight different skin tones per character, and we want to have the characters going in eight directions instead of four, it all adds up, um, plus some other stuff. So I'm going to show you a little uh, some of the art that we made, and then I'll, I'll tell you how we kind of got it done. So these are basically what you would need to make a game. Um, you need a user interface for your outer game loop. The outer game loop is everything that happens outside of while you're playing. So it's the start screen, uh, any kind of like save or load menus, stuff like that, the credits um, screen. This is actually our character select screen here. So rather than just have like a old school like you know single image of the character to, to select the character, we actually made this, we integrated it in to the game map. So these are like the little huts that your civilization, the, all the classes in your civilization uh, live in. And it's flipping back and forth between what's on the TV and the gamepad. That's why the, you got that color shift. But you, you would uh, move your cursor and then that trigger would come out. And you would send them into the, the temple you sacrifice and play as them. Uh, usually you would also have a pause screen that you would need to design. But uh, since we were trying to make the game really difficult, one kind of like prankish thing that we did was we just didn't have a pause screen. And we would actually make the pause button so that if you hit it, it would just kill you instantly. <laughs> and we thought that would be a fun little way to discover that. You know, like, uh, you know, mom's calling and you go to pause the game and your guy just blows up like wherever he's standing. Um, which seems a little unfair, but again, there's, there's We've we tied that into the game design we'll talk about a little bit. So this is, then you have the other uh, user interface. This is like the inner game loop while you're playing the game. So things like a quest dialog box, you have to consider um, all the colors for that. This is a uh, relic that you can take in that would you know, change your game. You can collect relics inside. So we needed to make a slot for that so that you know what relic you have equipped. These are various uh, bonuses that you can apply to your character. This boon point calculator, this is actually the core of the game right here. So what you want to do in Temple of the Aug is you want to get 20,000 boon points with a single character. It's very hard, probably about like an hour of straight play. Um, and what you would do is if you, if you don't get 20,000 and your character dies, like before I said we have permadeath, well, it's kind of true, but it's kind of not. So your character would die, like they each have unique names and stuff, but you would actually get to save the boon points and spend them on upgrading each of the classes in the game. So you're literally using the lifeblood of the tributes that you're playing as to boost your civilization and make the game easier for you by modifying like the strength of, of the remaining tributes. So that's what that boon point calculator is. The things underneath are your state indicator, so you know like how far into the game you are. And then there's a little life indicator there as well. These are the four characters of the game. So each one has like different special abilities. We have the cleric who can heal himself, um, the mage which has like a flying ability that lets you get over uh, like speed bumps basically within the game. So if you're being chased by an enemy, you can just like kind of hover over those. Whereas the other characters don't have that. The thief has like a super speed ability, and then the warrior does double damage and goes into kind of a berserk mode. That looks kind of cool. Now, with each character. Like I said before, you have eight different directions, five different states, you know, like idle, attack, run, special, die. Um, this is just a fragment of them. And then eight skin tones apiece, you can kind of see how these all add up into the number of assets that you need to generate. These are the different enemies that we have in the game. We have a planty biter here, which is like a stationary <coughs> enemy. It's good to have a good diversity 
in your enemy so that your player doesn't feel like they're always attacking the same type of enemy. So we have stationary enemies, slow enemies. This is a faster one, you can't really see them moving. Um, this is like a glass jaw enemy where you can, if it gets to you, it's a snake. If it gets to you, it does like three damage, which is a lot of damage. But if you shoot it once, um, you can neutralize it. But it's difficult because they're so skinny. <laughs> the wasp, this is like a, called a monster generator basically, so you have a nest and the wasps will just keep coming out of it and attacking you until you destroy that. So you want to have a variety of experiences for your player within whatever game you're developing. Otherwise, they're just going to get bored with it and, and move on to the, the next thing. Um, and then we have, this guy is actually the boss of the game and he kind of spies on you from the bushes throughout. <laughs> like you're, what you're doing is you're conquering the wilderness in the game. So as you advance through the stages, the leaves ultimately die and you know, become more brown. And this guy is you know, very upset that you're like conquering the wilderness. Um, and then he's got those little fairies that are his protectors that are basically what you have to attack in order to kill him. Don't attack him directly, but you have to do it. And then there's all the environments. This here is a final art com uh, comparison with the concept art that I did for the world map screen. And it's a little small here. But I just did this on some grid paper. These are like preliminary huts. Um, originally, the, the Elder Hall, which is right here, I thought we could go in a cave. But after we did some stuff within Unity and like laid it out, it just made sense to, to make it in kind of the center of the lake there. So like I said, this is the character select icon. So when the game starts, the camera's actually zoomed in here. And then once you select your character, the camera moves over here. And then you go up to the, uh, the Temple Zenith to go in. This is a preliminary version, early version of uh, that screen. You can see that, you know, it's kind of, I just wanted to show this whole process. This is kind of like an early painting version that I just did in Photoshop with just like a round brush to kind of indicate the hills. And then I would go back and later over it, kind of with pointillism with the pencil tool and make the pixel art version by hand. Um, this is the Elder Hut. These guys are kind of like uh, the old guys in the Muppets. So after you would die, <laughs> It'll cut to the Elder Hut and they'll criticize your playability, you know, in kind of a fun, fun manner. Uh, this is just like, like a um, quest monolith. That, that's how you get to quests. You see those in the game. And then that's a uh, bonus room where if you find a rare enemy and kill it, it turns into a portal. And you can actually go in there and screw your civilization over by boosting that individual tribute. You sell the, the boon points ahead of time before dying. It's kind of like cheating death. Which is good if you're like close to winning. You know, then you're like, okay, I can gamble and like use my boon points now and make this guy super strong and try and actually win. And then this is the Temple Zenith, uh, where you would actually go into the world to, to play the game. And this is where all the relics are hanging out once you discover them. So variety of objects. This is, uh, yeah, this is the boss area. So he would summon enemies in all of those summoning circles to attack you. So you're trying to kill those fairies, you're trying to shoot them. They're very small. You've got all the enemies that you've already fought now coming at you. Uh, if you're interested in uh, good learning game design, I'm going to recommend a YouTube video by this guy Ego Raptor. It's totally silly, but Mega Man X. He breaks down how Mega Man X teaches you how to play without giving you any dialogue. <coughs> you're like press B to do this. You just like learn how to play the game by playing it, and that is in and of itself kind of a retro technique. Nowadays, like in Call of Duty, they just want to kind of, they want to make sure you get through the game because they spent millions and millions of dollars on this thing, so they don't want it to be too hard and then the reviews come out and say this game is like unplayable. We didn't really care about that. We wanted people to say that. We actually got some joy out of some reviews that were like, you know, criticizing the difficulty. It's like, it's really good. <laughs> so these are some environments, um, and you can see with all of these things being animated, it can add up to thousands of frames of animation. This is just the warrior's death right here. Um, and that's like a little screenshot of what it looks like in Photoshop, how I like, kind of preview the animations. How it would work is basically I would send the artwork to Cody, the developer, and then I would give him notes and maybe like a little screenshot, like this is the timing of the animation. And then he would uh, integrate that within Unity to, to make the so uh, yeah, with all of those assets, it, it seems like it could be insurmountable for one person to do it all, but it can be done. Um, so this is how we did it. 
we basically made sure that we had regular product or project meetings, which some weeks, if it was a busy week, we would have them multiple times a day. Or if it was like slower and we knew exactly where we were going, we would say like, all right, what's this mean next week? And during this, we would uh, have like a progress report where he would tell me like, this is how far I am in developing, you know, the programming the game. And I would, you know, show him what I was working on and we would just do a little review session. Um, we also use Trello for project management. Does anyone here use Trello? Great, yeah, Trello is a great cloud uh, based project management system. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, we would, we would like also talk about like the logistics and the priority level of those. So obviously we would have pie in the sky ideas at the very beginning, don't throw anything off, but then when it comes down to crunch time, it's like, do we really want to spend like 20 hours implementing this feature or is nobody really gonna know if we leave it out, or, you know? Those kind of conversations. And the point of that is to create like a pre-cutting room floor, you know, so you're not investing in like the production time of actually making it and then being like, oh, this doesn't work, which we only had to do because there was only two of us. I'm sure <coughs> if we team, we'd be more into like, just like, oh, let's see how it looks. But sometimes when you're a small team, that's kind of how you have to be very agile. Um, and then we would uh, try to increase the efficiency, basically, every, like, how, what did we just do and how can we make that easier on ourselves in the future? Um, and how we did that is we would ask ourselves, can we reuse assets? Like, is there art that's already made that we can recolor, you know, like the skin tones, so that we can create a wide variety um, without actually having to make new art? Another way that we reused assets is all of the levels are procedurally generated. So I would just make a bunch of, like, all the plants that you see. I basically just made three trees, two shrubs, and then a couple walls, and then those were converted into tiles that uh, within the game, Unity would actually just generate the levels in between each one. So you always have a new map every time. That saved hundreds of hours of us having to manually generate uh, different you know, levels. So once we got the ratio, and how that was done, just from a technical standpoint, it's called a Perl and noise filter. So it would generate just like this black and white um, map, and then it would carve out little pathways for your character to Can you automate? Uh, back to the skin tones, I used Photoshop basically for that. I just set up a Photoshop action that said, look at this folder, open these files, try to find this color. When you find it, replace it with this color, save it in a new folder. So there's a lot of things that are buried within uh, what I would call like everyday art software, you know, that uh, you can utilize, you know, just let, basically let your computer do it. And the last thing, can you name your files properly, please? Like, this was actually like a huge efficiency problem with us because I could not get the hierarchy down, you know? And I learned, I mean, it makes sense, like when you're watching the console, you want there to be a proper hierarchy so you can know where to identify certain things. So, but yeah, organization is incredibly important. If you're working in a virtual space, you should think about it like a physical space, like where am I putting this thing? Am I just leaving it out, you know, for anybody to trip over? <laughs> And then uh, the other thing that we did during development was quality assurance. Uh, so we did routine play testing throughout development. About once a month, we would invite players of various skill levels and various gaming experiences <coughs> to come over and, and play the game, basically for the cost of pizza for the night. We were able to get a lot of good feedback uh, from players. And we staggered the invitations to new players. So we had like a group of players that we started with and we routinely invited them back so we could monitor, are they getting used to the game? Are they learning the game? Are they getting better? And then we, we also had a pool of new players that we would introduce that could give us honest feedback on things that we just introduced. You know, because sometimes older players would say, well, like how it was before. But we have to compare that with you know, the new players and see, is this a legitimate thing or is it just that they're used to playing like this? You know? Like one thing is uh, A and B were flipped at the beginning. And we kept getting you know, feedback on it, but we couldn't tell if it was like authentic feedback once we switched it, so new players helped kind of sort that out. Uh, we also recorded their faces so that we could see the moments of like contention, you know, or joy when they were playing and try and boost that because at the end of the day, your game has to be fun. Like that's what you want your game to be. You want it to be fun and I hate to use the word, but addictive. You know, you don't want people to walk away from your game. So being able to just kind of study them and see where their interests in this pipe is, is very valuable. Um, 
And then we also had them answer a very pointed survey after each play session that asked them specific questions about things that we just introduced or enemy difficulty, anything that they had problems with. So once we finished the game, the next step was getting uh, you know, it through the Nintendo process to get it on their consoles. Like I said earlier, uh, Cody had already showed them the game. They were very supportive of the idea. Um, they're also a large company, and they have a very rigid set of technical standards, you know, because they want the quality of what's on their, their consoles to, to be good. So I would just say, you know, if, if you're into game development and you're interested in working with any of the large companies, you should expect and budget that into your timeline that you know, there's just going to be a wealth of things that you probably don't know about if it's your first time you know, working with that company related to like marketing materials, you know, um, in-game uh, guides, stuff like that. Uh, and they also asked us to defend certain design, design decisions in the game, like the start button thing. <laughs> they were really upset about that. They were like, are you sure? You want the player to die when they hit the start button. And we were like, yes, that is not a mistake. And we were like, is this a bug? Like, no. So yeah, this was the this was the phase of the project where we hit most of our setbacks, but they were very supportive and the game, honestly, the game quality was brought up because of uh, some of their criticism. So I, I can't really knock them on that too much. Um, all right, so the game is out, now what? Now we have to think about how to market it. And if you haven't caught on by now, like we're a very DIY oriented group. Like we didn't really go to a lot of outside help for a lot of things, and, and we have the same exact approach with our marketing as well. So we had uh, we started things off with two launch parties for the game. We had one in Cape Coral, Nice Guys Pizza, and then one in Tallahassee where Cody lives at Fire Betty's. And then uh, we tried to do like this kind of like cross party. Uh, competition type thing where you give out prizes based on high scores. It's pretty fun. Um, we took the game on tour. So these are all the cities that we took. Now you'll, you'll see that this is in February. We actually launched the game in December of last year. Um, we took the game on tour before we even did any other play testing. We wanted to, A, get like total strangers to play the game first before our friends or anybody that we knew. So we knew we were getting like honest feedback. And B, we were hoping that this would be such an out there concept, you know, that we would pick up some press. And we did some interviews with like uh, niche press, like uh, Nintendo enthusiasts gave us like a really cool interview that came out to our Toronto show and did a video interview with us for their YouTube channel. Um, and then the reason I put this budget in here is just so you can see that the total cost of this entire tour was $3,600 which is the equivalent of going to a large gaming convention like the Penny Arcade Expo or E3. So it was kind of like, do we want to go to one convention or do we want to like do this kind of like old school <coughs> Nintendo style Power of the Players tour that they would do when they like release new consoles and stuff and hit up all of these different locations. And we had a wide variety of experiences. We hit retail spaces. That was actually an addition. Like we were just anytime we would go to a new town, we would get on Twitter to see where the gaming stores were, and so we'd just set up there for a little bit. So I was at a mall in uh, Boston, and then uh, Peter came on tour with us and like played the soundtrack of the game while people were playing the game, which I thought was incredible. I would love that experience as a player. Um, and then there was even the setbacks on tour were good. Like Baltimore, this was during the week, it was like the worst snowstorm in history. I don't know if you guys remember this in, in 2014, but our Baltimore show actually got canceled because uh, they didn't want people driving in it. Like the snowstorm had just hit. So we were shacked up in a hotel, and that's, we actually worked on development of the game at the hotel, and that's when we had all the voiceovers and stuff like that. So it kind of worked out to our advantage. Do you have an ROI for that? What's that? Do you have an ROI for that tour? Uh, I don't personally. Just but, as the artist, but but yeah. you figured it out. I'm assuming, yeah. like, because that would be interesting to see, you know, like 3,600 because that's reasonable, right? Yeah. And then you have like I don't know, 10,000 downloads because of that or something. Right. Yeah. I don't I don't know what the exact equation is, but he said it was a profitable enterprise. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's good enough. <laughs> um, we also submitted it to festivals. So this is a Orlando IX. This is some print matter that we we gave out that kind of shows like the uh, relationship between the the gamepad and, and the TV, and I, I kind of designed that to look like a 
old school NES uh, comic book advertisements, you know. Um, these are some players that we had here. We actually won runner-up fan favorite at Orlando AX, and we only lost to Sword, uh, um, Sword Coast Legend, which is an officially licensed Dungeons and Dragons game, so I don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> because, and they also have like a, a development team of hundreds. So I feel like we brought it pretty well there. Um, we also got invited out to Indiecade. I'll do a little time lapse here just to see this. Indiecade is like kind of the, the Sundance of, of video games. So you have to be invited to show there. So we were an official selection. We are also the only game that was on a Nintendo platform that was invited that year. Um, that was good. We scheduled interviews with the press while we were there. Um, we got some previews written about the game. Like, press members got to play it for the first time. And uh, network with other developers. So this is uh, somebody playing the game there. You can see that we got some swag down there as well. And then we did some other conventions. This is at the Orlando Maker Fair. Is anybody here involved with the Maker community at all? I would recommend it. There's a, there's a great uh, Miami Maker Fair and then the Orlando Maker Fair. I mean, these are like <coughs> very creative tech people. Like that's kind of their, their thing. They, they might not even be more entrepreneurial. They're just like idea people basically. So if you haven't been to the Orlando Maker Fair, that's in October usually. I think they're gonna have their fifth one. That one's great. This was at the Science Center. They've moved back over to the fairgrounds um, because they need more space. So they've got cool stuff like people playing guitars that are hooked up to Tesla coils and <laughs> all sorts of cool stuff. So we did that. We went to MegaCon. We had the game available to play at MegaCon and uh, the Game Developers Conference as well. And then this is just some of the swag that we made. <coughs> so uh, yeah, we had koozies, buttons, t-shirts, hoodies, all sorts of stuff. So uh, as far as, that was all the physical marketing that we did, like in person and stuff. We also hit the, the virtual marketing pretty hard. Um, so the important thing to know with marketing online is to know the audience for the community that you're marketing to because people are very defensive against ads online, you know? And this is an ad, let's be honest. Like, you know, it's, it's a GIF and it's video game related, but it's, it's an ad and it needs to be treated like such. So. Twitter is going to react very differently than Reddit is. You know, if I put this on Reddit, it's going to just get downvoted instantly. It's like it's too like it's got the press <coughs> on it. It's it's too obviously commercial. Whereas on Twitter, people go, oh, this is a good price, and that looks like a cool game. I'll I'll retweet it. Um, if you're going on Twitter, gifts seem to I found have had the best response for marketing. Um, maybe video as well, but gifts are very succinct, and for video games, you can put them in a and uh, we also took advantage of hashtags on Twitter. So Throwback Thursday is a popular hashtag, and when you combine that with like hashtag game dev or indie dev, you're really focusing on your core audience that's going to be interested in the content. So we use Throwback Thursday to kind of showcase uh, the concept art versus the final art, um, because at this point, like we've been marketing the game online, we've developed a little bit of the uh, community, and I would recommend uh, any, again any project that you're working on. Document the process, you know, take pictures of yourself working on it, take screenshots of the early stuff, and then organize it then so that when it comes down to the end of the product, you know, you can put that all out there, uh, you know, rapid fire basically, so you have a steady stream. Because especially with games, if you market your game, if you start marketing your game too much too early, people just lose interest. Once the game comes out, they say, I've seen it all, I don't even want to play it at this point, you know, I'm sick of seeing these screenshots. So, um, that might not be the case with whatever other uh, industries you're doing, but like I said, I think just documenting everything and then just having like a catalog of, of marketing materials that you can go back to later too. We also created our own uh, hashtag, so Tome Tuesday was one that we made, and it's called Tome Tuesday because when you die in the game, your character's name gets logged in a Tome of Tributes, which is basically your score <laughs> screen. You can also go back and look at them later, so if you want to memorialize the tributes individually. You can kind of see in the background here, you get like a kill count, the boon points that you earned, and the time. So what we would do is uh, we would say, hey, post screenshots from your tome of your best run, and then we'll collect them, and then we'll tag you in it and, you know, at the end of the week. So this was like a little campaign that we did when we first launched. 
And we also combine that with Meverse Monday, which was a similar idea, except we were taking our favorite Meverse content um, from the week and, and promoting it. Now, what's Meverse? Meverse is a place on Nintendo's platform where players can talk exclusively about your game. So you would have like, there's a message board component here where you, know, you can share tips or try and figure some stuff out. And then you can also do some silly stuff like post drawings and stuff like that. And that was, I mean, as an artist, that's like heartwarming. It's like to see fan art or like, I guess, satirical art <laughs> of your game. It's just like, oh man, like I did that when I was a kid. It's great. That was uh, bad though. What? That was bad. Dad, yeah. Well, yeah, that was my dad, though. No. <laughs> no, that would be too heartwarming. Uh, yeah, and uh, we kept the development blog on Tumblr, which is a great platform for Wii U players, and you know, it makes sharing the content very easy, reblogging it. And then we just used the tags on Tumblr to create these links so that if they wanted to look at all the videos, it would just you know, point to all the you know, posts that are tagged video. So it's kind of like having like a little mini website where you don't actually have to build the Um, and then a year ago today, we did a uh, Reddit AMA on uh, the Wii U subreddit, and that was that was a great way to kind of increase visibility for our game as well, right around launch time. We also used uh, Press Kit by Rami uh, Ismail, who is the head of like this hit indie game studio called Blambeer. So he saw a need for people. <coughs> so I had a need for people, like, you know, they were making their own press kits and getting caught up in making this website. Basically, this is just a tool where in a half hour you can put together a website that has all the press materials that you could need. So when you're contacting the press, you can just say, everything you need is on this website. It's got all of our accolades, screenshots, logo downloads, everything you would need to kind of craft a blog poster or something uh, you can do using uh, press kit. And that's how we utilize it. We would just cold email gaming journalists. You know, we would see who's like active on Twitter, who's writing about roguelikes. Just kind of dial into like, this person <coughs> seems like the type of person that's gonna want to write about our game. We, would, we made a list, cold email all of them. Whatever interested responses we got, we would give them a code so that they could download the game. And then eventually that filters down into actual results and we would get, you know, press writing about it. My favorite is we got a favorable review from Vice. I was pretty proud of. The rest of the critical reception wasn't great, to be honest, but the player feedback was good, and I like Vice, so I was satisfied with that. Um, and then we also got a little bit of the holy grail, which are uh, streamers. If you're making a game and you want to get visibility, if you can get people streaming your game, it's the best, because they're, mar they're distributing your, the idea for your game and marketing it for you. And they're also making it look really fun, usually, because they're trying to drive their engagement in their own channels. You know, so they're, they're like selling it hard for you, basically. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that was great, too. So uh, the takeaways, sales-wise, we had a strong launch and a consistent tail on that. So that's what we could hope for. Um, we're debating whether or not right now it's like worthwhile to add more content to the game to try and boost sales if it's worth the time or if we should you know, concentrate on other stuff. Uh, as far as like my first time experience in game development goes, it's pretty complex, but I discovered that there's a lot of tools that make it easier, like in Photoshop automation, and I was mentioning earlier Hazel's another great piece of software. Uh, that's a Mac only piece of software, but you can basically just like monitor files and then use that with Automator or something in Mac to run different scripts on your files. Uh, I learned a lot about asset management, organization, and even some new stuff about animation. This was the first time I ever worked in Pixel Art, so I was kind of like learning that at the same time too. So I'm used to just drawing everything. So figuring out how to animate Pixel Art was, was kind of a challenge. And last, I got to say that I worked on a Nintendo game which is pretty cool amongst people my age. So that's, uh, that's all there is to my presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, though, I'd be happy to answer some of those. Yeah. So what are you doing now? Are you still doing it, or are you doing something else? No, right now um, I'm working on, I'm basically trying to move into 3D. So like my personal pet project that I'm working on is 3D scanning at home. So just using like a digital SLR to like take a bunch of pictures of an object 
and then uh, use some software to turn it into a 3D object. So that I could basically, I'm trying to hack learning how to model by hand. <laughs> Even though I'll end up probably learning some of that anyway, just by hand doing that. So, uh, yeah, just looking for opportunities, you know, cool opportunities. That's how I got on this thing. It's just like, oh, this sounds like a cool thing to do. How long did it took your work? Mm -hmm. When did you start doing gym? Started in September 2014 doing concept art, and then the game was, we finished development in October, and then it was released in December. So almost a, a little over a year of development time. How old was? How many hours? Hour wise, uh, it was, I actually haven't done like the breakdown of the math, you know? I guess I don't, uh, I took shares and do like a, a wage, so I was just like working my ass off basically, because <laughs> yeah, I wanted to work it. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't done the math on that, but you know, there were some weeks where I was putting in, you know, probably like minimal 10 hours, and then some weeks where there was like crunch and we had a festival or something we wanted to be built for, where I was, you know, doing like 30 or 40 hours a week. So, um, yeah, it's hard to say, but a lot. Um, I'm stuck at the start button when the guy's done. What was, what, what, what was the strategy to that? I mean, so this, the, all right, so from a game <clears throat> design standpoint, it's to increase the emotional tension of the player. It's to feel like I can't set this controller down right now. I have to finish this. I've, you know, been working on this. It makes everything. It just heightens the like the tension of every. So going back to the addictive part, mom called me. I'm stuck here. Right. Exactly. And yeah, just uh, I hadn't I, again like we hadn't seen that mechanic in where there was just like a straight up suicide button that was also the pause button. You know where you're. That's like the safe spot on the controller. You know? Supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was kind of the idea behind that. And then we're just like we're just pranksters of art. You know, so it's just fun to. How was the feedback to that? Uh, more negative than positive. You know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, like, like, okay, so in our Nintendo enthusiast interview, the, the guy the guy interviewed us brought that up, and I don't know, we just enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I like, that's one thing I'll, I'll always refuse to apologize about. That. That's cool. Did you guys build cheat code then? Sorry. Uh, initially we did, but I think, all right, so I think they're all taken out, but since I didn't program the game, I can't be certain. I'm almost, he seems like the kind of person that would bury the easter eggs in there. So I haven't discovered anything. But yeah, we totally had like uh, a boon point cheat code where just like cycle your score up so that we can get through, you know, during play testing, get through the, the game quicker. So we didn't want to play for an hour. Like we designed it to be difficult. So we had to build ourselves a little god mode, basically. Uh, yeah, how long did it talk, uh, the process of going through? That was, uh, it was, it was pretty easy actually. So there was a lot of like non, uh, non-committal information on their part, you know? Just like, this is a good idea, you should pursue this, you know? And they had, uh, <coughs> they had at the time, the new development portal is actually a lot more accessible than the one that we did. And the one that we did was pretty accessible. You basically just apply, you say, this is my game idea. And if they like the idea, you don't even have to show them anything. They'll let you in, you know, you have to sign an NDA, and then all the stuff that I can't talk about because of that afterwards. But yeah, very accessible. They're probably like the easiest entry point to indie game development outside of like mobile, you know, as far as like consoles go. But Sony is very indie friendly, and uh, I don't know any indie, devel indie developers that prefer Xbox, but they all go on anyway because why not? You know, if you're developing for Sony, it's just you know, a couple different clicks on your export to an indie. <coughs> so yeah, it was uh, it was just one of those things where they just followed us throughout the year. We just kept in contact with them. We went out to GDC. We scheduled a, a meeting with them just to kind of do a, a status update and see uh, if we were going to you know work with them on marketing or anything. But really, that was way outside of their scope for us. I think. Yes. 
So we work with uh, a French company and uh, they worked with game developers mm -hmm. and basically what they did is um, is created these algorithms so that the, the gamer loyalty uh, never faded or actually increased because there were certain frustration levels beyond which they just dropped the game. Right. So, so basically these guys figured out those kinds of ways where somehow you got a additional little help so right. that you you get a little bit because when you try a level you know 40 50 times or more right. and there was a certain point of frustration which yeah. which you're just not gonna go beyond right. so these guys were created those kind of algorithms where uh, that loyalty never faded but just help them through yes. and then next it's level a, it's a delicate balance and we, we were totally algorithmless mm -hmm. okay <laughs> we were without algorithm for that so yeah, that's where we, we just re relied on like the raw player feedback, you know. But did you experience that kind mm -hmm. of, uh, that it's, it was way too difficult, that people just dropped the game because it was way too difficult? We never got, we never got any direct feedback, like emails, or at least I didn't see anything that was mm -hmm. like asking for a refund because the game was too difficult mm -hmm. or anything like that. Not, not necessarily a refund, yeah. but, but how many people, you know, the, the, how many people actually stuck with the game over you know, extended amount of time. Yeah, I um, I I don't have access to those metrics, and I don't know if I don't I don't even I, I'm not certain we could get that um, based on the, the analytics that we get from the, the gameplay. We get sales analytics mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but as far as like hours played, um, I don't think we have that. We just have to rely on like whatever feedback we get through text, like if it was on Meverse or something. Sometimes, this interesting thing is, um, we also modeled the game to be more like those old school games, so we didn't like really hold their hand through it. Like, when you, when you fight the boss, you don't know that, okay, so once you kill all the boss's fairies, he like erupts into flames and becomes, you might have seen the giant flaming head, like shooting fireballs. Mm -hmm. And we never say, you can't kill this thing. Like, it just chases you around until it kills you. And when we were, when we brought to a festival, we watched this guy, like, try to kill this thing for, like, ten minutes. He was just perfectly evading it so that it never killed him, even though that's what it's trying to do. Because the game is about human sacrifice, so even if you win, he didn't realize that, like, if you just die, you, you win. You know? <laughs> so, there's moments like that that are interesting, and sometimes we could get something on Meverse where it's like, can you kill the boss? And it's like... Just die. <laughs> <laughs> Just die. Yeah. Finally. But I mean, are you are you thinking of a two point version? Yeah. I mean, we've we've talked about all sorts of ideas. Uh -huh. um, but he just had another kid this year, and he was also just in like a, a like he got hit on his bicycle, so he's mm -hmm. recovering right now. So uh, we'll probably talk about that more in the new year. Maybe that could be built into the game. Yeah. You know? I mean, one thing that we've talked about that we really want to do is like a multiplayer, mm -hmm. like a one on one mm -hmm. multiplayer, where you go into the dungeon. It's your tribute versus somebody else's tribute. And you mm. might have all the benefits from your personal game. So, from anywhere in the world, you can play multiplayer right. type of yeah. deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I know he's I know he's been looking into that, like server wise and stuff like that. But we, we don't have any plans right now to like actually begin okay. legitimate development on that. That's possible. I'd like to go back and like work on that card game that I was working on again. That's kind yeah. of my next personal goal. But if he comes back and says, "Let's do it." <laughs> What's the card game about? It's called Slurp, and you play out the life of a sloth on planet Slurp. <laughs> so uh, it's a set collection game where basically you want to draw from the pile and get three level one cards. And all the level one cards are things that like sloths do. You know, you sleep a lot. It's like a very personality driven game. And then the second level cards are things that all like human babies do. Like you learn to walk upright, you learn to talk. And then the third level is things that humans do. Like oh, you get a job as a sloth graphic designer. And just do all the sloth graphic designer. So, so what, how do you come up with the the game logic for the previous game or for this game? What is are you are you the only one who is figuring out the game logic, or well, there are others who? Yeah. We'll play uh, or so, work with you. So he had already built that prototype, so the core game loops were already designed, and then uh, we would just kind of spitball ideas <coughs> off of each other, you know, and anything that like landed with both of us, he would actually like program. So like, right, let's, let's take okay, it. so for that one, there was already a game logic developed. 
Yes. But but otherwise, for this one, you are the one who is actually creating the game right. logic. So, so yeah, my whole process with that was uh, I wanted to make a like a card game that would be like under ten dollar price point, like that. So very, and very simple to play. So you mm -hmm. can like take it to a bar if you wanted, you know, and you'd only have like nine cards in front of you. It wasn't like a complex European style game. And then uh, also just start with the core mechanic. You have to figure out like what the core mechanic is. So like for Temple of Yogg, the core mechanic was the uh, screen swapping. So anything that we added after that, um, which was, I mean, that's basically what the prototype was. It was just like, this is the loop. You <coughs> play, you die. There was like, you know, there wasn't like that distinct enemies. The enemies didn't shoot anything. It was just kind of like, this is like the idea of this core mechanic. Anything that you add after that should enhance that core mechanic. Otherwise, it's something that will make your game boring. So uh, with Slurf, the core mechanic is just the set collection thing. And I knew because I didn't want to make it a complex game that all you would need is that core mechanic, a couple different cards that would you know, drive engagement, like attacking other players or slowing down other players, something mm -hmm. to get like, kind of the social aspects. You're not just like doing your own solitaire thing. And, uh, and then just like focusing on like making some like funny sloth drawings mm -hmm. and kind of like sell it at the end. And did you did you write a script for for you know the screens and how the flow is going? So there was some kind of for the whole story there was a script written, yeah. or or it was just you know as it, as it came. I was I was I was personally pushing for like a very direct narrative uh -huh. in the game, um, but uh, we didn't explore that. So, the but the, so, so there, there was there was no script for the uh, story of the game. No, there was a premise, and then we wrote a script for the dialogue for the elders. Okay. You know, so there would be kind of that dialogue, and then when you interact with the boss, there's also a script there, mm -hmm. scripted moments there. But everything else is pretty much action oriented in, in the game. But mm -hmm. as far as like the game loop and stuff, yeah, there's like a lot of notebooks full of di filled with diagrams, like this screen connects to this screen. Mm. Which has to have these elements, you know, and that, that's kind I of. I mean, that's the game logic. So, right. so basically, you develop the game logic and the scripts along those various screens. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, the dialogue, like, we almost like, since it wasn't an integral part to the game, uh, we almost considered that like polish. Like, mm -hmm. so it was like, we'll do that at the end, you know, once we get like all the, the meat of the development mm -hmm. out of the way. And then later on, we'll. You, you want to build about like 10% of your time of your development time to go back and just make everything look great. You know, mm -hmm. like, all right, we've got everything working and functioning now, now let's go back and just like raise the, the quality of our, all the effects and artwork and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. we kind of built it into that because we knew that there wasn't that much. So bottom line, do you play that game? And have you learned, like, go back and you play and go, oh man, if we did it this way. Uh, Oh man, I don't think if we did it this way, because yeah, I'll get totally sad. <laughs> um, it's it's a hard game, and I played it so much during development that you you hit those moments where you don't you're starting to question everything. You're like, is this even good? Like, what am I doing? Like, this this might not even be that good of an idea. And that's when you really need to like go back and like look at your player feedback, you know, and stuff like that, and kind of give yourself a boost in it. Also, having little moments like where you're like talking to press and trying to get previews and stuff and having encouragement from outside sources is really nice because if you're you know just locked up drawing or programming, you can get inside your own head a lot. So yeah, I want to add on to this. Um, I completely agree and I would support that 100%. And you know, if you don't have a, a working product out there yet, so while you were in development, and he was making the point that they did a ton of user testing, right? Like they got they got friends, family, strangers, I don't know who yeah. in, and had them play the game. The same applies to pretty much any idea. If you develop a product or you know software, whatever you do, you get out there and get user feedback. Do a lot of a ton of user right. testing, and then when you hit that point, and I've been personally at that point multiple times myself, where you question everything and you just be like, I don't know, I I, I think I just I just convince myself, go back to that, right? Like, or, or go out again and talk to people, because it's not what you think. It's if the people out there think you have something valuable. Yeah, and we, we also try to uh, get that feedback after every like major iteration as 
well. So anytime we made like a significant change, you know, we'd get feedback on that and either roll it back or you know continue forward based on the feedback that we got. So design by iteration. There's something that we do on Git uh, on web applications that is called user stories, where you start everything from that, like just you put yourself as what a user would want, and then you get other person to say, what would you like as a user before you even start building anything? Because a lot of times, programmer thinks, you know, this is what, what it should be, like you say, this is what it should be, and you don't even think what the other person actually wants. Right. So, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, there was actually, uh, oh man, I can't remember, I can't remember if it was last week mm -hmm. or like a podcast that was like right that same day, but they were talking about, um, basically designing to your specific users, not to your average user, and that there's a benefit, because you're gonna get the average user anyway. It's kind of like the idea of designing towards accessibility, you know? Actually with this game, so the blue, the whole blue thing, you know, on that, that second screen, that was like an artistic nightmare, because I actually, I've got like, friends that I play video games with that are colorblind, and some games that we play, it's like they have to be player two, because if they're player three, their player indicator will match the color of the football pitch, you know, and then they can't see their character, so they're like totally useless. <laughs> so I thought about Joe when I was working on this game, you know, like how is Joe going to see it? Luckily, Photoshop again has like a color blindness, couple color blindness filters that you can pop on and off to see that. But using that and then thinking about the two different color spaces at the same time so that everything like the, the UI is you know available to colorblind players that are looking at the TV or at the screen of multiple types. Photoshop actually made it very easy to check for that just by like turning on like you know a couple layers and, and options. So and actually I wrote a, an essay about that and put it on to this industry blog Gama Sutra. And uh, it circulated among the accessibility community. We picked up some fans because I wrote this article. So it, it does make a difference. That's, I believe that article is on the meetup. Yeah, it actually. is. Yeah, you can, you can read about that. It's all about how it's got comparisons. It shows the Photoshop filter turning it on and off a simulation of colorblind players. So. That's cool. Would you call it a success? Yeah. How many copies have you sold? I can't talk about it. <laughs> how do you measure success? Well, I can't talk about it. I mean, I know. But he knows. <laughs> so, <laughs> a strong knowledge. So, someone coming now today here, mm -hmm. looking at you and, okay, a year of investment, time, money, whatever it is, has it made? I, for me, no, based on my share total. But the game itself did well, yeah. The game itself was a success. So, but, Nintendo is happy. So. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Maybe he had the I'm, I'm, I'm happy <laughs> enough. It's, 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 uh, I didn't, you know, I took the shares and I invested a lot of personal time in it, yeah. you know, um, but I do feel like I got advantages outside of, like, a monetary success from it, so. Yeah. So that's what I meant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With the licensing and all the merchandise. Yeah, that was part of my deal, too, is that I am, like, the sole merchandiser of. Yeah, that's really so, I mean, funny. Any, yeah, yeah. You know, funny guys. Putting the t-shirts. Nice. Sale of the game, yeah, but you know, that little knickknack keychain thing. Right. I mean, that you know, five ninety nine a clip on. <laughs> right. That's, that's the money maker, right? Kids love swag. <laughs> that's a sure. <laughs>
Adventure Company. Adventure and Company. Adventure and Company. Dot com and buy a money card or a keychain. Yeah, something. Like that. Uh, yeah, there's tons of original art on there as well. Like if you're into like art history or I do a lot of Dungeons and Dragons related art as well. Um, where is it? I mean, that's the last slide anyway. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming out. That that's pretty much it. You're welcome to hang out a couple of minutes here. Um, Peter will kick us out eventually. <laughs> and, uh, but then we're going to go to the United Ale House. As I was mentioning before, they're going to cut us a uh, happy hour pricing deal again. And if you do want to come out, then see me because we have those nifty little tickets which show them who you are. Great. And then I will wrap it up with saying thanks for coming. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, if I don't have the answer, I'm, I'm happy to make a connection with someone else in the group who might have the answer. That's what it's all about. Right. Great job. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.